So welcome everybody. This is, uh, I'm Lisa Curtis. I'm the Director of Development and Community Outreach for Via Mobility Services. And uh, this is our quarterly transit talk where we talk about uh, transit issues and mobility for people across the community. Uh, this uh, tonight's session is about a partnership between Via Mobility Services, Colorado Car Share, Boulder B Cycle, and Community Cycles. Uh, this partnership, uh, the purpose of it is to explore how to support a shift away from personally owned modes of transportation and toward mobility as a service. The goal is to create a seamless system of community transit that is affordable, equitable, accessible, and environmentally sustainable. So unfortunately, um, our representative from uh, Community Cycles was unable to attend this evening, uh, but uh, we do have representatives uh, on the panel this evening from uh, Via Mobility Services, Colorado Car Share, and Boulder B Cycle. So what we'll do is we'll start off with a brief pre presentation and some slides from uh, those three organizations. And then we'll have uh, time for a lot of questions and answers and discussion uh, about the topic of um, just how, wh what mobility as a service is, <laughs> what that means in, in transit talk and um, what the options are and how, how we can create the seamless system of, of mobility across the, the uh, community. Um, I'm gonna start with, uh, I don't think, uh, uh, our first panelist is Peter Cramble. Um, Peter is a sustainability business development and communications leader with years of experience working with business, government, and nonprofit organizations. As CEO of Colorado Car Share, Colorado's only and one of the nation's longest running car share organizations, Peter is at the cutting edge of, of what he calls sustainable mobility solutions. This includes driving forward shared electrified mobility for everyone, uh, including underserved communities. So I am going to, with that, I'm going to share my screen and uh, Peter is going to walk us through his slides. Thanks, Lisa. Can you hear me okay? I can. All right. Let me start the uh, presentation over here. Oh, I've got to. There we go. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Lisa, and uh, everyone else who's on this. Um, particular panel, all my other speakers and everyone who's joining us um, to see what's going on in this wonderful world. Um, so yeah, as Lisa mentioned, just give a few super quick uh, overview of Colorado Car Share for those of us who maybe aren't as familiar with our organization. So you can go ahead and jump into the that next slide, Lisa. So yeah, Colorado Car Share, I think some of you are probably familiar with us. We're actually over 20 years old now. Um, we're a local nonprofit originally from Boulder, um, now in the Denver Metro and Boulder area. And we're um, sort of, you, yeah, you can stay there for a sec. We're, we're uh, Colorado's first only and one of the nation's longest running nonprofit car share organizations. And our mission really is to empower our community to live a car-free lifestyle or what I call a car light lifestyle. Um, and, and in doing so have a positive impact on our health, wealth and the shared environment. Um, we, we do that, you know, as a nonprofit, we have kind of a, a two-pronged approach. So we have our mission-driven education, outreach and advocacy side around non-single occupancy vehicle ownership and use and alternative mobility options. 
Um, and then operationally, and, and this might even be what more people know us as is where um, a car share organization with over 3000 members in the Denver Metro Boulder County region that provides uh, 24 seven member access to a network of now about um, uh, 55 plus vehicles in the region. Okay, next slide. So yeah, you can, again, uh, we have member about 3,000 to 3,500 members around Denver, Boulder, Boulder County, including the city, uh, Longmont, and now recently launched in Louisville as well. And I like to um, explain to folks that you can kind of think of what we do and, the, and our vehicles as sort of your uh, your local sort of neighborhood car in that the vehicles stay stationed in these different neighborhoods around the region um, and they often become people's first or in some cases of families like second car for example in the case of our all-wheel drives for example with ski racks or bike racks um, and it really is a way that helps people to also spend a huge, hugely less amount of their income on transportation th um, through car sharing versus individual vehicle ownership. Okay, next slide. So that, yeah, that just gives you a, an idea of, you know, most of you, if you're in Boulder, you know where a lot of our cars are. We, you can see we're also all around Denver. And then as mentioned um, in other parts of Boulder County, Longmont and Louisville, and we have um, a lot of specialty vehicles, so mostly hybrids. We're trying to be the first to electrify um, fully. So uh, we have now about 15 electric or plug-in hybrid electric vehicles and then specialty vehicles, including those all-wheel drives that I mentioned, as well as pickup trucks. Okay, next slide. Uh, so one of our goals, as mentioned, with our mission is really to connect car sharing and our locations with complementary mobility options nearby and through our um, through our partnerships, for example, really support um, support mixed income communities in particular in particular. So we have a strong social equity focus as well, where sort of like transit can be the backbone, um, but we can also complement that with uh, car sharing and other multimodal. Uh, mobility options. So uh, this is kind of one of the things that got us in this awesome discussion with Via Mobility and um, Boulder B Cycle Bike Share, Community Cycles, etc. So uh, that's it for a quick overview on what we do and I'll hand it back over to you, Lisa. Great, thank you so much. Um, Sarah Michaels is uh, going to be our next presenter and uh, panelist. Sarah is the Director of Marketing and Communications uh, for Boulder B-Cycle. She loves to think up the many reasons people should be riding an e-bike instead of using a personal vehicle. She feels strongly about the environment and what people can do to help solve the many issues, like riding the B-Cycle e-bikes instead of running a car around town for your shorter trips. So Sarah, you wanna take it from here? Uh, sure, hi there. Um... Let's see. So yeah, here's a, just a short overview for those that aren't familiar with um, Boulder B-Cycle. Um, we've been in Boulder since 2011 and just celebrated our 10th um, birthday. Um, we have about around 48 docked stations um, all over down Pearl Street, uh, 29th Street Mall, um, heavily up at CU on CU campus and, <clears throat> and all over town. There are about 300 bikes total. We have 100 e-bikes that we just launched at the end of um, February this year. Um, those are the white bikes you see buzzing around town a lot. You see one here in the photograph. And then we still have our classic red pedal bikes out um, as well in, at our stations. Um, we have an app, the B-Cycle app. Um, you can use that to buy a pass and check out your bike. And um, you can see a... Uh, <clears throat> a real-time map of the whole system. So before you head out, we always recommend people download the map, the app so you can see if you're you know, walking to get a bike at a particular station, you can see uh, how many bikes are there, um, if there are any e-bikes there available for you, if that's what you want to ride at that time. And also if you're returning a bike, it's nice to know 
that your destination uh, station has an open dock for you to, um, to return that bike. Um, we have annual, monthly, day, and paper trip passes. Our e-bikes are um, pedal assist, so um, you know there you just start pedaling and you can feel um, feel the assist um, bump in once you get going. And there's always the option also to turn off the computer so that you don't, if you're not interested in using the assist, um, they go up to 15 miles per hour, which aligns with the um, city's regulation on e-bike speeds. Um, they're a great first and last mile option and a no sweat, easy, affordable, fun, and healthy way to commute around Boulder. So yeah, as I mentioned, this is uh, a snapshot of, the, um, of uh, the system map, which is both on our website and, and in the uh, app, as I mentioned. Um, in this way, you know, you can see the number of bikes that are at each station, as I said, and the little lightning bolt down there below the number indicates that um, there are e-bikes there. And if you were to click on one of those stations, um, say the Alpine station, it shows six bikes are there. If you, once you clicked on that <clears throat> icon, it would show you, you know, four e-bikes and two uh, classic bikes. So it does drill down a little more once you click on the actual station. Um, and we, you know, like I said, we have stations near um, a lot of the bus stations and other popular destinations around town. Um, so here are some fun facts. As I mentioned, we just rolled out 100 e-bikes. Um, when we do, we our well, our hope is to be fully electric at um, one day. Um, in under four months of operation, uh, thousands of riders have used Bicycle for more than 50,000 trips. Uh, as of today, um, only 100 of Boulder Bicycle's 300 bikes are electric, but the easy bikes are ridden three to four times as often as the classic red pedal bikes, which just you know really goes to show you the um, popularity of, um, of, of e-bikes and, and their high use. Um, by August 2021, the Boulder Bicycle system will likely have exceeded the total number of annual trip from any previous year. So that's a real um, huge for us because that's, I mean, it just goes to show you how many more people are using these bikes. Um, Boulder Bicycle e-bikes provide an extremely easy and inexpensive way to try an e-bike with rates as low as $5 a half hour using the paper trip pass or $10 for a day pass. And that includes unlimited 30 minute trips and a monthly pass gets you unlimited 60 minute trips. So, um, you know, there are a lot of options out there for however, you know, the best way you wanna use, use our system. Okay. So this, um, this is a great visual that just goes, you know, just shows you each month you see the blue bar is the classic red pedal bikes. And then the red bar shows you, um, rides per bike per day by month. Um, so you can just see the heavy, you know, how heavy the usage is um, of the e-bikes over the, um, the pedal bikes, which is why so many systems are going to, you know, all electric and, and hopes for more, you know, more higher use. Great, thank you. I think that's it. Great, thanks so much. So next up, is Frank Bruno. Frank is the CEO of VIA. Uh, he's brought a wealth of leadership experience to our organization from uh, diverse uh, entities that include for-profit companies, nonprofits, and government entities. He was the CEO of Western Disposal, the city manager of uh, the city of Boulder, the assistant city manager of Fort Collins, and chancellor of administration at CU Boulder. And uh, he's been leading us through a number of changes and a lot of challenges. So, Frank, yeah. take it away. Thank you, Lisa. You, and you promoted me there. I was uh, vice chancellor at CU. Oh, <laughs> don't sorry. Wanna get, I don't want to get Bill DiStefano angry at me. He's the actual <laughs> chancellor. But no, thank you, everyone. It uh, really is wonderful to be together. I, I think just a little tiny, tiny bit of history of, of why we're even together this evening. Uh, several years, it, Peter, it must be three years ago, if not a little bit more, uh, that Peter and one of his board members, his board chair, Zach, 
came to visit with me to talk a little bit about the notion of, you know, why, why aren't we talking and working together on some things? And one thing led to another and, and um, we wound up sharing space at our building. Uh, so that's been now for a couple of years and it's, uh, we enjoy it. We, it gives us an opportunity to, to brainstorm, not as much as we'd actually like, um, certainly COVID got in the way of that. And then Peter connected me with, with Kevin Krauss and Sarah. Uh, I had known Sarah a little bit before, but uh, the fact is that having the mobility services, Colorado Car Share and B-Cycle together uh, in, in philosophically as well as strategically just makes sense. The way I like to think about it, and then we'll get into more specific about VIA is that uh, we're focused on, on doing, and that is not, when I say that, I don't mean that as a criticism of other entities that plan, because I think it's important to note that Boulder Transportation Connections, the city of Boulder, uh, commuting solutions, are all engaged in the space of really planning uh, for the future of our region from the standpoint of commuting. And I would just like to focus on the fact that that VIA and car share and B-Cycle are actually, you know, we're involved in, in the, the capital side of it where we're rolling stock, rolling buses, bicycles, cars uh, to address the sustainability goals and the equity goals of the region. So. Uh, as the slide indicates, our, our mission, our founding mission, we're 41 years old, is to promote independence and self, self-sufficiency. The way I like to think of it is we connect people with their communities, plural, because whether it's healthcare, whether it's grocery, whether it's friends, family, uh, or jobs and volunteer activities, people need to be connected. And oftentimes, mobility is the, is the limiting factor. So switch slide here. And I'm not going to read this to you, but we really do. Our mission does touch everyone from uh, the way I described it, whether someone's working, volunteering, or needs to be plugged in uh, to the healthcare system in one, one way or another. People have, have needs and they also have opportunities to give back to the community and, and VIA is there to help them do that. Most people don't realize, first of all, a lot of people were not aware that VIA is an independent organization or an independent 501c3. We're not part of local government. We're not part of RTD. We are separate 41 year old 501c3. Uh, initially, we were dependent upon philanthropy. Over the years, we've taken on a social enterprise model, which is a, is a nonprofit way of saying we operate like a business. So we have earned income contracts. And the beauty of this model is that we use our earned income contract revenue to help subsidize our, our own paratransit, our white and black vehicles that you see rolling around that provide the door through door high touch paratransit is subsidized by our uh, providing hop service for the city of Boulder, uh, accessoride service, flex ride service with RTD. We have a new core department, which is a special contracts department that's been providing service in the Carbon Valley, Firestone, uh, and Decono, and hopefully very soon Frederick. Uh, we have uh, Park to Park, which is the Chautauqua shuttle. And last year we started the um, El Dorado Canyon State Park shuttle. We started our pilot with City of Lafayette and Boulder County for Ride Free Lafayette. I don't want to give you, you know, the the full menu of things we provide, just that we're very much engaged in the in the paratransit side as well as uh, in the community transportation side, and uh, I believe very soon we'll be much more engaged in the workforce shuttle transportation side. We're also a second responder, as you see listed there. Uh, again, most people would not think of our buses and, and think of being in that light, but whether it's wildfires or floods or very, very, very sadly, uh, back on March 22nd, with the King Supers shooting mass murder there, uh, VIA was very much engaged in, in providing uh, assistance to victims' families, uh, both in terms of providing our facility as a gathering spot and a spot for service, uh, but we also help 
transport people in times like this. So uh, very engaged in the region, very engaged in the community. We are also very engaged in sustainability. Uh, we have quite a bit of solar uh, installation on our building. Now that we have three brand new Portera electric buses, our uh, percentage of, of coverage of our uh, uh, electrical needs has dropped a bit. So our desire is to continue to complete a microgrid and build in more, uh, more solar. We would like to convert by 2030 the entire hop operation uh, to fully electric and uh, continue on with our body on chassis, our paratransit and shuttle vehicles also uh, continuing to convert to electric or possibly hydrogen fuel cell, but we've got to be able to support that. So envision a VF facility with a lot of solar installations, solar canopies and, and the like. So renewable power, powering uh, electric vehicles or electric and hydrogen vehicles. Lisa, is there, there we go. Um, so, and I mentioned the goal of 2030 um, and the paratransit fleet by 2035. That's gonna to be tough, uh, the, the paratransit fleet, mainly because those vehicles haven't really been in the marketplace. They're beginning to be, we've been approved for our first, what we call body on chassis. It's a Ford engine component with the box on, on back with the seating. Uh, that will likely be in the first part of 2022. And that will still be a conversion, very much like our, uh, you, I think most people are aware of the uh, hop bus that we converted from a fully diesel to a fully electric platform a couple of years ago. Of years ago. So that is our fourth, now our fourth electric bus on the, on the hop route. Um, and as, as uh, the slide indicates, and I mentioned earlier, we are continuing in our effort to convert the Boulder headquarters into a microgrid that will capture solar. We also have our Denver, which is really more of an Adams County uh, based facility for our accessoride and flex ride work, and also our, our uh, metropolitan area paratransit work. We would like to focus on a new facility for a new expanded facility for that operation and one in which we can make significant investment in that area with sustainability as well. We think that is vital to our success. You can't just be successful transporting people. We've got to be successful being, being as green as we can and, and achieving as close as we can, as Will Tour like used to say with respect to zero waste, pretty darn close to zero uh, tailpipe emissions. And that concludes my slides. And I, I think it went a little over, but I appreciate the time. You're fine. So we're gonna open it up for questions now. Um, let me see the chat and see if we've got. Um, so I have a couple of questions. Um, I have a question for B-Cycle. Um, what's the easiest way uh, for someone to start using uh, your transportation options? And could you give me some examples? Um, yeah, does that mean, I guess they're asking how do they get uh, acquired to get, get a pass? Like what are the steps to get a pass? Right, what are the steps? Um, the best way that we recommend is, um, like I mentioned, is download the Bicycle app and then it's free. And then once you download that, um, you'll uh, have a drop down of options. And from there, you just select which pass you'd like, and then you just go through the prompts. Um, and then you um, go to a station, choose your station. And then, like I said, you click on the, um, you click on the uh, station icon and it'll pull up the number of bikes that are there and the numbered dot, each dock is numbered. So let's say you're at the, um, 13th in, um, uh, let's say Alpine and Broadway station. And you walk up to that station and you see there's an e-bike in dock number six. So you would, um, you'd see on the screen, the diff the numbered um, docks would show up in the app. So you just press that dock of the bike that you want and it beeps three times. There's a green light will go on indicating that the um, bike is ready to be pulled out. 
and then you pull it out and you adjust the seat to your height uh, and then turn on the computer if it's an e-bike and, and just right away and just you know stay within the limit depending on which pass you get there's a um, 30 minute and 60 minute limits on the passes so you just want to return it before that time's over does that answer the question yes it does and i have a kind of a follow-up question to that i'm just curious about the technology behind all of this um it, it sounds like each e-bike um is uh, it has a gps signal <laughs> associated with it is that true um they, it's not gps um it's just it's our it's, it's just our software program it's the database behind it all that you know I mean as to how the app works and shows all of that yeah so how does it know i mean it seems like there must be some kind of signal to let you know how many bikes are at the particular at a station at a particular time right is it uh yeah again that's just our that's our um that's our software and in database that shows that but the bikes do not have a gps in them okay like once you okay. ride away on that bike um yeah that's we're not tracking where you go or anything <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, how do you, how does someone get started? Uh, you know, starting an account or using it for the first time. Um, like I said, just just like I said, just download the app. It's I mean, okay. it's, it's that simple. There really is, you know, it's as simple as that. You just download the app, select which pass you want, and go through the prompts. You do put in a credit card, um, and that is um, that you know that charges you know charges to the payment of your pass. And then, like I said, if you go over, there are overtime fees. So you just want to stay in within the time limit of the pass that you purchase. Okay. What are the fees? Um, they are for an annual pass is $150. And a monthly pass is $20. And then a day pass is $10. And um, and, and then you can do a paper trip, like say you, you didn't want to, you're not going to ride all day or you're not going to go to a couple of different locations. I mean, you don't have a couple of different stops. You're just, you're literally wanting to go from, you know, the 29th Street Mall down to Pearl Street. And that's, that's all you're going to do for the day. So you don't need to buy a $10 day pass. You can just, um, you can just, you know, pay for that one trip. Okay. Great. Thank you. Peter, I have uh, similar questions for you. How does somebody get started using Colorado Car Share? Yeah, so we, I, as I mentioned in my um, brief overview, we're a membership-based organization. So we're very, you know, we're very different than like, I think what pup, some people probably think of as more like rental car agencies, for example. Um, you become a member, you fill out a short application, and we go through um, a bit more due diligence in that we do like a background DMV check and we have to ensure that all of our members have, you know, a relatively clean uh, driving record. So no major infractions like recent um, DUIs or anything like that. And then um, that usually takes a couple of business days. And then once we go through that process, um, we welcome our members on board. So again, typically locals, although we do have some out of towners that, um, that you know, will visit Colorado frequently, for example, or, you know, visiting students or professors for the summer or whatever the case may be. Um, and then the other thing is that we, because we're very member driven and community oriented, um, we have people go through a brief online orientation that just helps them to become familiar with the technology, with the vehicles, with the fleet, and probably most importantly with sort of community protocol for our members around like not returning a car late and, you know, not leaving it messy for the next person because we kind of sort of depend on each other. Um, in order to make this a successful program. And then once they've completed that application, gotten the clean DMV um, background check and completed the online orientation, they receive our um, sort of our welcome packet with a key fob, which allows them 24-7 um, access to the vehicles when they are available. They make reservations themselves online. They have access to that. 
uh, through our website, for example, and it's all relatively straightforward. They, it's kind of like a self um, serve process, not, not nearly as, um, you know, not, not as quick and convenient as with B cycles, download the app and, you know, you, you're kind of good to go that it's a little bit more involved, but, um, still pretty easy and straightforward once people become familiar with it. So you need to go through the uh, website and make a reservation, uh, be, um, and see what's available on the website. Yeah. Once you, um, so, so they, you know, they fill out an application at carshare.org and, once they've been approved and received their key fob, they can go online, log in. They have their own personal account with a login uh, and password, and they can go ahead and then make reservations and see what's available. They can choose by location. They can star their favorite locations. For example, a car near their house. Um, they can also choose vehicles by attribute. So if you're looking for a vehicle that has ski racks or bike racks, or um, an all-wheel drive or more and more now an electric vehicle, then you can choose according to attributes, location, et cetera. So um, tell me about your electric vehicles. What percentage of the fleet is electric now? Well, as <laughs> of tomorrow, we're launching our 14th and 15th EVs. So we're we're excited. That's getting us up over 25%, close to 30% of our fleet that is now electrified. And they're awesome cars. They're, for those of us not familiar with EVs, it's kind of like, I say it's like driving a spaceship. Um, and yeah, they're super fun. And we're hoping to be close to fully electric by 2025. 2025? In an ideal world, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um, so just, you know, for people who aren't used to the term uh, mobility as a service, does someone on the panel want dis to discuss that a little bit? Uh, Lisa, this is Frank. Um, the risk of, of being rude, I, I'm. Uh, I want to introduce one of our uh, attendees, and it's it's Debbie Knoll. Debbie is uh, a VIA Mobility Services member of our board of directors, uh, which has been fabulous. Debbie's a writer. Uh, Debbie's an author, uh, Longmont resident. Does an awful lot of of work for the region and for the communities in so many ways. Debbie, if 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 I'm not imposing too much or being rude, I was wondering if you might share your thoughts about mobility as a service. Debbie, I can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. Well, thank you for asking me. You know, I have very strong opinions about this. I know. I have been paralyzed 30 years and I came from Pennsylvania, moved out to Colorado uh, five years ago, and my choice was, do I give up, do I get good health care with my money, or do I continue to pay for my car with hand controls and the maintenance of the car and all of those things? And because I'm now in my 60s, I made the decision that it would be better to go for health care. However, when I got out here, I did not have a way to get around, and I'm very spunky independent. I didn't want to rely on family members or friends to get me around. When I started calling for services in Colorado, I received a lot of sad answers like, oh, you're in a wheelchair? Sorry, we don't serve you. Click, hang up. And I was going down through a list and VIA with a V is towards the end of the list. And by that point, I had had not one person say, yes, we can serve you, Miss Noel, in a wheelchair. So when I got to the V's, I called VIA and they were immediately responsive. They said, yes, we can you know, get you where you need to go. Here's our services. And I was used to you know, 30 years of being in the system, uh, whether I'm independent and working or whether you know, you're getting any kind of services of any kind, you get this disrespectful treatment of, well, prove you're, you're paralyzed or prove that you're sitting in a wheelchair, which to the person with a disability is the most bizarre question ever. 
with Via, I did not have to ask any of that, answer any of that. They respected me, they trusted me, they believed me. Over the phone, we completed the, the registration. Uh, they sent a form in the mail, I signed it, filled it out, but I was able to get a ride immediately and it was lovely. I have fallen in love with the drivers, the, the employees, everyone is so kind, so thoughtful. They are, um, it, you know, at first it was embarrassing, I, you know, here I am, I drove my own car for decades and now I have to rely on someone putting me up a lift, getting me on the bus, locking me in. It's not what I wanted. However, after the first day, it truly was like, get over yourself, Debbie, it's not a big deal at all. You're getting around, you're getting your back in the community. And it's just been a lovely, lovely, lovely service that I can't say enough about. Well, thank you. You're, and thank you for all you do for Bia. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Debbie. And and that's Lisa. That's kind of to me the the beauty of this. Um, I envision someday they'll you know there there'll be more than the three entities, but um, absolutely. But that's the beauty of the mobility uh, partnership is that you know Debbie's story is about more about Bia, but it could be about a person who is uh, living in, in a relatively small apartment or unit in Boulder or somewhere else in the region and really can't afford to have a car in, in light of, of, of their living conditions and that sort of thing, and truly wouldn't need a car with car share, or perhaps is you know close to the trail system and wouldn't need a car because of the bicycle system and because of B-cycles. So, I, I think there are these stories that if, if we dig down, we don't have to dig very far to get stories for each of us uh, that are that are meaningful and are are truly um, vital. This is Peter. Can I add on to that, Lisa? Absolutely. Um, question, you know, mobility as a service to me, and I'm not an expert at, in MAAS, but you know what I, what we see is that if we think about mobility in general uh, from a historical context in America, anyways, and we hear the word transportation, and I think, or I feel like our brains automatically go to car ownership right? Individual car ownership and the freedom of the car and everything that it brought with it some time ago. Um, but that's all evolving. And the, you know, the, the important point is that as individuals and families and, and as people, we're trying to simply get from point A to point B and maybe C and D and back to A. Um, and, it, and so transportation and mobility is about getting there and doing so efficiently and safely and without causing harm to the environment or public health or other people walking down the street or on their bikes or whatever the case may be. So from my perspective, mobility as a service is about these alternative options that are better in those ways that can support sort of a happier, healthy community and society and environment and all of that stuff. And I think, I think that's what brought this collective group together, which is we are those service providers trying to connect those dots and complement each other um, without having to add more and more and more and more single occupancy vehicles on the road. But, you know, uh, that brings to mind another question one of, I know one of the goals of this partnership is to create a seamless system of community transit. And I, I, I'd like for each of our panelists to kind of address this. Where are we now in terms of having a seamless system? And how far do you think we have to go? And how do you think we'll, we can get there? Frank, do you want to start off? Sure. You know. Uh... What, what's in the back of my mind is, is something that's coming down the pike. And Lindsay and I were talking about this earlier. Uh, the employee trip reduction program is something that'll come, probably be uh, unveiled by the state in the fall. 
but employers will have to um, file plans, have their plans for how to, uh, to reduce single occupant vehicle trips by their employees by this time next year. And I, I had a meeting with, with one of the vendors that wants to help uh, do the tracking with, of that effort today. And we, we did a couple of examples. And you know I think what it, what it showed is for several obvious addresses where two and a half hours uh, of commute time one way right now. So I think what it suggests is that we're not as far along, Lisa, as we need to be with respect to being seamless. Because right now that whole uh, first mile, last mile, meaning the first mile of your commute to get to a transit system and the last mile to get from the transit system to your place of employment, if you're working in an office or a facility of some kind, is a big challenge. And that is a big part of the limiting factor. And again, I think it's it, one of the ways that the mobility partnership can solve that. Of course, you're not gonna necessarily rent, a, you know, do a car share to go that first mile and then jump on a bus. But it, it, if that's part of your uh, occasional need, then you might well do that, but you might also do that with bike share. So I would say that we've got a lot of, um, a lot of work to do to close that first mile, last mile gap that exists, as well as providing more on-demand local transit, local community transit. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about beyond just Boulder. I'm talking about every local community and I'm talking about right-sized electric or at some point hydrogen fuel vehicles, renewably powered. That's, I think, the big gap. So I think we're very far away, quite frankly, in my mind at least, from that. Thanks. Peter, do you want to follow up? Oh, wow. And, um, and I don't know, are you able to share your video? It says, when I try, it says, I can't start my video because the host has stopped it. So I don't remember doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if it's in the setup. Uh, so I think you're in the you're in the driver's seat. Um, okay. On Mine was the same. Sorry. Mine was the, says the same thing. Yeah, I think Lisa. Okay. You so in the meantime, I guess we get to spare everyone from looking at me, um, <laughs> which is the, to their benefit. But um, uh, I, I feel like our collective energy and uh, hope and desire in you know the direction that we all want to be heading is very much toward this seamless seamless system of um, mobility services that come together in a way that's different than the past. But I feel like from a practical standpoint, we're still heading in the wrong direction. I feel like we're actually going backwards. And I think the numbers support it. Um, if you just look at traffic increasing, people moving to the metro region, workforce commuting into Boulder, for example, we're just so far, you know, not, not moving in the right direction. And I, and I think it's going to take some, some significant paradigm shifts. Um, you know, like the example Frank just mentioned about uh, employers having to come up with a plan to reduce those commuter miles, for example. But um, we have to we have to do a heck of a lot better before we start moving in the right direction. Thanks. Sarah, did you want to follow up with that? Um, I agree with Peter in the sense that um, of a lot of the things that he just said uh, about just the growth of our area and the traffic and um, you know people just not wanting to give up those personal vehicles or just you know look at other options. I mean that's what I'm doing in marketing all day with you know BeCycle is um, you know offering different ways you know you know, most trips within Boulder are under two miles. I mean, you know, why not hop on a bike instead of jumping in your car and starting that engine? Um, 
So uh, yeah, I, I think it's got a long ways to go, but I think this is a great start I and mean, you gotta start somewhere. And I think the more, more minds, the better. And if we just, you know, continue working together and um, sharing ideas, I, I feel confident we can get there. Now, Lisa, I used to, I used to believe that the, the big limiting factor to the front range, the, you know, Fort Collins to Colorado Springs, at least, portion of the front range was going to be water and that you know we would see a limitation of, of developments residential developments uh, primarily because of water and then what's happened is you know a lot of the family farms that have populated the the plains um, and the south south uh, boulder creek basin you know have gone under and and sold water rights uh, land and water rights to the development community and nothing wrong with the development community, but that's where the water is gone. But now I, I believe as, as Peter and Sarah just indicated that I, I really think that, you know, I remember Royal Romer back in the 1990s coming up to Fort Collins and rolling up his sleeves at a smart growth meeting with us and, and lamenting that he was terribly worried that the front range was going to look like the LA basin. And where you just drive or you know, bicycle or walk from one one community to another, and you have no idea where you are. And I think we've done a good job of achieving that. And that's not a that's not a positive statement. So I I agree with my colleagues. I don't think it's I don't think all is lost, but I think that as developments are approved, I think they've got to start looking at planning boards and the various local governments have to start looking at linkages. We used to link affordable housing. Now I think we've got to link uh, mobility options for development approvals. So neighborhoods that are being built need to have shuttle options and car share options and bicycle options um, in order to get approvals. Yeah. I wonder if any of our attendees have more questions along these lines for our panelists. You can share them in the chat. Can I throw in an addition, Lisa, while we're waiting for sure. So I kind of left out when you asked, we really focus on the app. You know, we really want people to use the app. It is the easiest way. Um, you know, it's also, um, with COVID, it was also the safest way, right? But there are kiosks at every one of our stations. So you can walk up to a kiosk and uh, same method, you just go through the prompts, put your, slide your credit card in and go through the prompts and check out a bike. So yes, you don't, I wanna make sure people know, yes, we, you're not limited to having that, you know, you don't have to have a phone, you don't have to have, to have the ability to download an app. Um, you can also um, purchase a pass on our website as well. So there are other options to do that. And then that said, I just wanna to toss in, um, we just started a program with the Boulder Public Library called Book a Bike. And that is for folks that do not have, um, that are unbanked or do not have a credit card or a way to pay, you know. So we are offering our bikes. If, if you are in that situation, you can check out one of our bikes just as you would a book at the library. And you'd walk in and um, you can check out one of our, B, our RFID cards. And oh, that's really great to know. Yeah, very important. It hasn't started um, yet. It won't start for another week or two. There's lots of bureaucratic layers we're working through, but um, but yes, I just wanted to make mention of that. So we want to make sure our bikes are available for everyone. That's yeah. That's a very important point about equity. Yes. Um, and and thanks for making that effort because that's really important. Everybody has access to a public library and yep. and. A, exactly a public kiosk, so that's great to know. So, um, Someone wonder, has their hand up in the attendees. Like Andrea has their hand raised, Lindsay. So oh, okay. Uh, Andrea, can are you able to uh, unmute yourself? So you have to give Andre, uh, Andrea a prompt to unmute. Yeah, I'm...
think I've unmuted you, Andrea. Sorry. There you yes. are. Yes, you have. <laughs> I, I just wanted to comment. I was on the Centennial, the City of Centennial Planning and Zoning Commission for 12 years. And every time a development would come in, I would say, but there's no transit. There's no way for anybody to go anywhere without a car. And pretty much for 12 years, I was completely ignored. And I found that very, very frustrating. I understand what you're saying about not being there yet. We aren't. And I have no idea what it will take to actually be there. Um, in, in the early 2000s, when my daughter was still in Denver, she um, belonged to, I think it was car to go They're gone now. But she did not own a car. And often where she needed to go was a little bit too far for walking. And the buses don't always go where you need to go. And she just used the car to go she'd walk out of her building and there would be a car in front of her condo building. She'd get in the car, take it where she needed to go, go into her meeting. When she came back out of her meeting, there was a different car in front of the building and she would take that different car back home again. The car share is a brilliant idea and you don't have to worry about the insurance part of it either. I am so glad that there still is a car share opportunity for people. Thank you. That's interesting. It's been, it's a perennial problem, it sounds like. <laughs> Changing this culture. Uh, does anyone else have anything they wanna to add to this conversation? I guess it could be helpful for the um, the transportation bill that was just passed. It's hard to say how much of that will help us. I mean, a lot of it's going to, going to be fixing roads and bridges. I'm trying to learn more about it, but um, that was a little bit of hope, I, I guess, depending on how that gets allocated. Yeah, yeah this is Peter. Um, if you can hear me, I think Andrea's points were extremely relevant and it's something that we see all over the place um you know and from the car share perspective a couple of points on that you know i feel like when you're interacting with local municipalities as we do often because they come to us um but the request is usually hey why don't you just come in here and be here <laughs> um and you know our our response, and and as as was pointed out with the car to go example, many entities have tried the free market approach, come in, uh, explored the market, failed, and left. Um, we're extremely fortunate as a nonprofit, um, as Frank mentioned, a social enterprise version of a nonprofit, um, where we're still around after 22 years. But the point remains which is uh, municipalities, while great at, for example, courting developers, until the, the transit mobility transportation needs are internalized, we're gonna continue to have these issues. And I think, you know, kind of speaking from the economist uh, background, it's a, it's a situation of the tragedy of the commons, right? Where they're gaining the benefits of local development, um, but the, the, the costs of transportation issues are more or less externalized regionally. So what we, what we need to see is more of a regional approach. And that has got to come from a regional to state level, right? So, and then Sarah just mentioned the, the transportation bill. Well, we've been pretty actively paying attention to that as well. And while that bill had a great focus on potentially adding um, a quote unquote fee, some would call it tax, potentially on certain mobility options like car sharing, for example. Um, what we have still not been able to glean from that, as Sarah alluded to, is 
where the revenue from that is going to go to on the multimodal approach. So who's going to be making the decisions around whether or not that's going to car sharing or bike sharing, et cetera, because that is extremely unclear. And I think we need to get very clear on issues like that and very specific on issues like that at that state level, for example. Thank you. Are you, is anyone aware of uh, more regional efforts along the lines of the partnership we're discussing here today? I have not heard of anything um, like this. I, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, I, ne I always hesitate to say we're, we're the first of its kind, but, um, but I wouldn't be surprised. And, you know, I, I think what we're doing possibly could be linked with Fort Collins and transport and points in between. Lisa, can you hear me? This is Debbie. Yep. Yeah, I can hear you. Um, I'm on another board called the uh, Boulder Community Steering Board. And part of what they're doing, it's out of the university, is looking at ways to unite services and how to pull together all of the different services where someone can come to a one-stop shop. And what that looks like, we don't know yet. This is just the early stages of this one-year project. But I think this conversation is interesting to me in terms of how to link transportation as part of that. And again, looking at my experience, which was the hospital gave me a list of vehicle opportunities to call and none of them were available till I got to the V's versus someone that I can call that immediately can say, oh, you wanna call VIA or you wanna call the bike share or you wanna call the car share or whatever it is and begin that process of linking us together in a way that's serving up each other. Yeah, that's interesting. So it's a one year project, I guess it's grant funded. Yes. And Lisa, I would just tell you, we just had a meeting, um, we being CU representatives, uh, Boulder County, City of Boulder, uh, Boulder Valley School District and VIA. Uh, to talk a little bit about the capital calls with the state of Colorado and the fact, again, once, once again, you've been part of these, these conversations in the past, Lisa, where, you know, we're all going to submit applications for capital for electric vehicles and charging stations. And, you know, at some point, we're all going to be trying to place ourselves in front of the other entity. And, you know, that's not helping our region advance either. Um, and, and tackle these problems. So we talked about, is there a way we can, mm -hmm. you know, it sounds so simplified to say work together, but, you know, can we pick, maybe instead of theoretically, can we pick a project specific uh, that we can work on together in, in that regard, much like uh, this partnership can. And so that's another thing that I think we're, we're gonna try to do. Yeah, I think there's a lot of potential with that approach. Am I still live? This is Andrew. You are. You're alive. Um, go ahead. <laughs> um, I went to an RTD accountability committee <clears throat> hearing the other day, and the accountability committee is urging partnerships. Yes. So possibly we will start heading in the right direction. And I know VIA already has a working partnership with RTD, but there should be more out there. They're pretty serious about working with other organizations. Yeah. Thank you. I, Andrea, I agree. And our partnerships go back quite a while ago with respect to RTD. And, and again, I'm not gonna throw them under the bus, but I would say that, uh, that there is work to be done to improve those partnerships and expand those partnerships. There's no reason why uh, entities like VIA couldn't be doing more of the local transit. And that would give us more of an opportunity to pick routing with the local governments and therefore work with car share and bicycle sharing to make placements of, of facilities and infrastructure. Agreed. 
Uh, and I have a, a comment here from uh, Landon Hilliard. Um, and uh, Lindsay, I made you the host. So maybe you can allow Landon to maybe ask his question in person live, or I can read it from the, uh, the Q&A section. Okay, give me one second. Landon, you should be good to go. Well, this is Landon Hilliard and I don't have a question really. It's just a comment along the lines of thinking regionally. And one hopeful aspect that we've been reading about is the possibility of a regional rail line with partners of Amtrak and RGD and local governments thinking about how to transport people from all the way from Fort Collins to Denver and to uh, Colorado Springs. So it's a hopeful sign that the uh, uh, that people in the state of Colorado are thinking that way and understand that um, development and sprawl um, needs to be serviced in some ways along main corridors. Well said, Landon. Thank you. Thanks, Landon. Sorry about the technical issues we had today. I'll try to fix that before we have our next transit talk. Uh, does anybody have any uh, last points they'd like to make? We're, we've just, we're a minute past 6 p.m. I wanna thank the uh, panelists and everybody who attended. Uh, I appreciate the discussion today. Um, it was uh, very interesting. Uh, lots to think about and lots to plan for. Um, if uh, anybody has any follow-up questions or requests for future transit talks, you can go ahead and contact me anytime uh, by phone or by my email address, lcurtis at viacolorado.org. Thank you so much for attending and have a great evening. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone.